They call him the Ukrainian Spartacus. People have preserved his memory for centuries. His name is mentioned in historical annals and folk poems. The great Ukrainian poet and bard Taras Shevchenko repeatedly mentioned him in his works as a national hero. Every generation of Ukrainian writers turned to this historical figure. Further, the brilliant poetess Lina Kostenko mentioned him in her historical poetic novel Marusa Churai. In the 1990s, Ukrainian writer and film director Mykola Vinhranovsky and historian and writer Vitaly Kulakovsky dedicated their historical novels to the hero. And the list goes on. So why is this historical figure so popular and respected by the people? How did it turn out that this leader of the Cossacks, who lived and was highly active over 400 years ago, became so famous? In 1594 to 1596, a captain of the Zaporizhian siege, Severin Nalivaiko, organized a very strong anti-Polish uprising. It encompassed the territory of Ukraine from Volyn to Chernihiv, as well as a part of the territory of modern Belarus, which were all part of the Polish Commonwealth back in those days. The unique feature of the uprising organized by Severin Nalivaika was that it fit the international context, as we would say now, from the very start. The matter is that the Turkish, Tatar, Polish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian and Belarusian people were all actors in this extremely complex controversial historical thriller, known as the Nalivaiko uprising. In addition to that, such outstanding figures of European politics as the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, Rudolf II, Pope Clement VIII, the Turkish Sultan Mehmed, and the Polish King Sigismund III Vasa were all in some way involved in those dramatic historic events one way or another. Unfortunately, this uprising was doomed to fail. However, it became a bright page in the history of Ukraine, which is why it quickly became replete with myths and legends. The execution and death of Nelly Vaiko in later years assumed more details of a particularly cruel form of torture in the annals and chronicles of history. This was a clear indication that he eventually became a favorite folk hero among the masses. The identity of Severin Nalivaiko attracted people's attention not only because his struggle resulted in a gruesome death on the part of the enemy, it was also due to the lack of an official theory of his origin. Due to this, many manipulations and falsifications around his name appeared. For example, Russian imperial historiography depicted him as a leader of a gang of bandits who, like Robin Hood, robbed the rich and gave money to the poor. In the Soviet times, Severin Nalivaiko was considered a peasant son a poor Cossack and a classic liberator of the working people. The figure of Semeri or Severin Nalivaiko is mysterious and controversial both in Ukrainian and world history. It is unknown in what year he was born. Problems arise when historians try to determine the place of his birth. Some say that he was born in Husiatin, a city in the modern-day Ternopil Oblast. Others say that he was born in Ostro or even in Kamenets Podilsky. His origins are unknown. It is most likely that he descended from the so-called Lower Boyars, who are some kind of military warriors. He had tried this military brat from a young age. He served in various enemy countries under different headmans in military apprenticeship. After a person completed that, at a decent level, they could claim various reasonably high positions, both military and and civilian. Given this, it is quite obvious that Prince Ostrovsky offered him to join the ranks as a captain of his personal court guards. Nalivaiko was an aristocrat. He was a well-educated man. There is a theory that he studied at the Ostrog Academy. 
Nalivaiko got the chance to show his military talent to the full extent in the military campaign of 1593, when the Ottoman Empire declared war on Austria. That posed a serious threat to Ukraine, since the Ottoman military campaign was to pass through its territory. Without the necessary military forces, the government of the Commonwealth requested the Ukrainian gentry to create self-defense units. Severin Nalivaiko, who had been serving in the army of the Ukrainian prince Konstantin Ostrovsky, organized a Cossack squad and set out on some successful military sorties to the Ottoman Empire. During the last campaign, in 1594, Zaporizhian Cossacks joined Nalivaiko. According to the estimates of Polish scholars, the number of Cossack troops was 12,000 at the time. The squad was led on one side by Hrihori Loboda, hetman of the Zaporizhian Cossack troops, and Severin Nalivaiko. They went on a campaign to Moldova, which resulted in completely unexpected geopolitical consequences. As a result, the Moldovan ruler Aron reoriented from the Turkish Union after his defeat. When the Cossack army captured the capital of Wallachia, Iasi, then this country along the Danube River chose to take the European vector. As a result of the military campaign of 1593-1594, the Cossacks ended up in control of the vast territory of modern southwestern Ukraine. The Cossacks were no longer content with the role of just some armed people who patrolled the wild field, and so they went on sorties against the Tatars and farmed the land. In other words, having felt their military power, the Cossacks started declaring their political rights. Severin Nalivaiko addressed a letter to the Polish king justifying the expediency of creating a Cossack territory led by an elected hetman between the Dniester and Buh rivers. It was presumably supposed to serve as a springboard in order to fight against the Ottoman aggression. Those were the so-called conditions. In essence, they offered the king the creation of an independent Cossack Ukrainian state in a compact form. They also mentioned the payment of taxes, protection of the territory of the Polish-Lithuanian state, and the establishment of a Cossack registry exclusively on legitimate grounds. It is clear that neither the Polish king nor the gentry he was dependent on could or would agree to such conditions. When Nalivaiko's letter to the Polish king was ignored and the Cossacks couldn't resolve the issue of free farming on their land, they rose up against the Polish oppressors. Back then, the Ukrainian lands were in a difficult position. After the Union of Lublin was adopted in 1569 and the Ukrainian lands were transferred from Lithuania to Poland, the Polish administration started going against the rights of the Ukrainian population. National, religious and cultural oppression increased drastically. The very existence of Ukrainians as a separate ethnic community was in danger. The Polish gentry that came to the Ukrainian lands was, unlike the European gentry, numerous and was divided into different classes. There were the descendants of princes and rich gentry that had no princely titles, but it was distinguished by antiquity of origin, inherited lands and certain privileges. And there were the middle and small gentry, who received titles and the right to own land strictly on condition of serving in the military. They gave rise to a specific ideology that took shape, called Sarmatism. It was the gentry that considered themselves descendants of the ancient Sarmatians, who conquered all the Slavs back in their day. Supposedly, Sarmatians had some special rights. The gentry themselves thought they received all those rights of the human race from above. First of all, that gave rise to such a psycho-physiological state in which they separated themselves from those who they called plebs. At the same time, on one hand, that incited narcissism among the classes. On the other hand, there was complete disregard to other ethnic groups and confessions. In the end, 
that gave rise to such conflicts in the form of massive national upheaval and intense social movements. In the autumn of 1595, an uprising led by Severin Nelivaiko covered the modern territories of the Vidnitsa, Khmelnytsky, Kiev, Cherkasy and Poltava oblasts, as well as Volyn and partially Galicia and Belarus. In December 1595, to suppress the uprising, the Polish government sent troops led by deputy army commander of the Polish kingdom Stanislav Zolkiewski. Under the onslaught of the superior military forces of the Commonwealth, Nalivaiko's troops were forced to retreat, first to Volyn and then to the provincial town of Bila Tserkva. Back then, he was not the only one in power. There were several Cossack leaders, Vihori Lobada and Matvi Shaula. They were basically both in command of the Cossack army. Sometimes they acted separately, other times they coordinated their efforts when they managed to gather a large enough army in the end. In March 1596, regiments of Severin Nalivaiko, Rihor Lobada and Matvi Shaula united and defeated the advancing units of the Polish troops near Bila Tserkva. When the main forces of the Polish army arrived, a bloody battle took place near Topilia. The rebels were forced to retreat to Lubny. Not far from this city, in the Solonitsa Gali, the rebel units built a well-fortified camp with four rows of carts surrounded by a rampart and a moat. Each siege lasted almost two weeks. Negotiations began during which Stanislav Zolkevsky promised an amnesty for part of the Cossacks if they laid down their arms. Several senior officers grabbed Nalivaiko and other leaders of the uprising and gave them to the Poles. During the negotiations, the Polish army attacked the Cossack camp and completely destroyed it. After the traitorous seizure of Nalivaiko by some of the senior officers, Polish soldiers attacked the Cossacks, many of whom were totally unarmed. There were also many women and children staying in that camp, and practically all of them were mercilessly slaughtered. Nalivaiko was sent to prison in Warsaw. They tortured him for almost a year. The Cossacks tried to arrange his escape, but Nalivaiko didn't manage to get out. The same gathered in Warsaw, and the gentry demanded to execute the Cossack leader. Severin Nalivaiko was an extraordinary man, since he was educated and had plenty of experience in fighting. For this very reason, he posed a serious threat to the Polish side. They entrusted suppressing this uprising to the regular army instead of the militia, which clearly indicates that they took Nalibaiko quite seriously. Moreover, the investigation and the duration of the trial and the fact that the Polish king was personally interested and controlled the interrogation process played a major role. The execution of Nalibaiko on the central square in Warsaw, instead of somewhere in Husadin or Volin, meant that the Polish government took Nalivaiko very seriously and was terrified. But at the same time, they respected him. He was not hanged like an ordinary criminal. He was executed as the highest state rebel and enemy of the state. It is a substantiated historic fact that Nalivaiko was quartered in front of a huge crowd after the meeting of the Polish Sejm on April 11, 1597. This showed the deep hatred of the Polish gentry and their fear of the Cossack Ottoman, who kept the whole country on edge for a year and a half and who dared to go against its power and laws. The execution of Nalivaiko left a long-lasting impression on the Ukrainian people. Many stories and legends spread about his bravery during torture and execution. Both life and death of the Cossack leader left an indelible mark on the memories of the people. In his time, Ukrainian historian Mikhailo Hrushevsky noted that soon after his death, or maybe even while he was still alive, Nalivaiko grew to the size of a rebel and a contender for the throne as a candidate for the king of Ukraine.